Um, so I just a bit about me. I've worked at King's for quite a while now. So I started at King's in September 2020, um, working in admissions and outreach. And now I just do outreach, but I still know the admissions very well. I work in the admissions office. Before that, I worked at another university in student finance. So if anyone's got any student finance questions as well, please feel free to ask. Um, I haven't put anything about it in here because it is incredibly boring. But if you've got any questions about student finance, please grab me. Um, and as Miss said, I'm around kind of after this as well. So if you've got some time before you have to head off your lessons, come grab me if you've got any questions that you don't wanna say in front of everybody. Um, so I've got a bit of everything here. I know you guys haven't done too much about kind of university applications and Oxbridge stuff yet. So this is kind of a bit of everything. But if you've got any particular questions, please just ask. So basically, I'm going to run through an introduction to Cambridge, what the city's like, what Cambridge is like if you haven't been there before. A bit of info about the collegiate system. If you guys aren't too familiar with colleges, I'll, I'll see where you're at with that. And then and then basically going through the application process and kind of what it actually looks like, looks like from your point of view and also from our point of view. So what we're actually looking for as well. So hopefully it'll answer some questions. Um, and then if you need any support, kind of obviously further down the line, you've got my I will give you my contact details. So you can always reach out to me as well. Um, and as I said, I'll be I'll be around as well for like the UKS fair and stuff. So I'm always reachable. Um, so first up, anyone visited Cambridge before? couple of you okay awesome um so if you haven't that that's where we are um so we're about an hour on the train north of london um maybe a bit less than that um and oxford for those of you guys who might be interested in oxford they're kind of southwest of us they're not too far away from us either um in terms of what it looks like as a city um, this is taken from the centre of the university map, but all of those orange buildings, it's the very centre of Cambridge, all the orange buildings are all colleges. So King's College, where I'm from, we're here, um, kind of looking, uh, we back onto the River Cam. Um, so that's all the colleges around the city. The blue areas are the faculties. So the main arts and humanities faculty, for those of you interested in that, is here. It's the Sidgwick site, um, but there's some based on these other sites here. Um, and then for sciences, the science site is just off the top of the map, up the top there. Um, it's huge um, and lots of very new fancy buildings, like the, the computer science building is incredible. Um, so that's up there. Cambridge isn't super big. Um, Oxford's a little bit bigger. Um, it looks like all the university buildings are pretty spread out, but there's a rule, and I'm pretty sure this is still the case, that all Cambridge University buildings need to be within three miles of Great St. Mary's Church, which is kind of there in the middle. So it kind of, nothing's that far away. So when we say far, we mean Cambridge far, like it's, you can walk it, it's not far, um, or you can take a bike. Um, so we're a bit more spread out than say whole uni. I imagine most of you guys have been over to the whole uni campus. It's, it's all in one place. Um, we're a bit more spread out than that, but, all kind of throughout the city like I don't know if any of you guys have maybe been up to Durham for example the layout's quite similar like all the university buildings kind of around in one place like that's the kind of vibe of Cambridge and Oxford looks pretty much the same I don't know if any of you guys have been to Oxford but they're very similar buildings Oxford Uni is a little bit older about 100 years older but they're very similar cities um, in terms of why I consider Oxford and Cambridge I won't go into this in too much detail because you're here and you are considering Oxford and Cambridge. Um, the main difference between Oxford and Cambridge and other universities in the UK are one, that we have colleges, we have a collegiate system. Durham also has a collegiate system as well, um, but that's kind of the main difference between us and most, most universities. The other difference is that we have small group teaching called supervisions. Um, at Oxford, they call them tutorials you will probably learn that the more you look into Oxford and Cambridge that we love acronyms and ridiculous old names for things and this is what happens when you've been at university for a thousand years you just have ridiculous terms for everything but basically supervisions and tutorials are exactly the same thing um, and they're small group teaching so you have a few of you normally about three or four students to one supervisor going over whatever it is you've been working on that week so it could be um, an essay you've been working on it could be some like a maths problem sheet it could be a project whatever it is you'll go over that um, and kind of 
go over it really in depth. So, I mean, imagine, I don't know if any of you guys have a couple of very small classes, but you can imagine it's very in depth. Like you go over anything you don't understand, you get really in depth into your subject and you get to know your supervisors really well, they get to know you really well. So it's really high quality contact time. So that's one of the main differences between Oxford and Cambridge that doesn't really happen at other universities. You tend to have about one supervision um, per week for each topic you study, for each paper you're studying. It can vary slightly, but that's usually how it kind of, how it lays out. So they're kind of the main things. The other thing is that there is a lot of support available at Oxford and Cambridge, um, which I think a lot, one of the biggest concerns I get from students who are thinking about Cambridge or Oxford is that they think it's going to be really intense they're going to be working all the time and there's not going to be any support to help them out and the workload's going to be really heavy um, there's a lot of support because we know our courses are tough so in your college you'll have a director of studies you might see that called a dos um, again more cambridge slang um, but they are basically your head of subject they're there to look after you kind of academically um, you might have um, one for all the students in your in your college studying a subject or it might split up over years if you're a bigger subject but you'll have one person that's there to look after you academically um, and you also have a tutor a bit like a form tutor um, but they are not from your subject they're from a subject that's different to yours and they're just there to look after you in a more pastoral sense um, so for any other concerns you have um, there's also a lot of other support kind of based in your college. So at King's, for example, we've got a college nurse, um, a cognitive behavioural therapist and a mental health advisor on staff for students if they need any support. Um, and then the students union as well. So every college has their own students union as well as the main university. Um, and then there's a lot of financial support available. Um, I know that's a lot of one of the other major concerns I see is finances. Um, a lot of people worrying that Cambridge will be expensive. Um, there are, the main thing um, that for you guys to maybe be aware of and certainly to have a look at if you're curious is the Cambridge bursary. Um, so that is means tested based on your household income, but you get up to three and a half thousand pounds a year of um, free money essentially as a grant to help you out with your studies. Um, and you don't have to apply to that. That's basically given to you, assessed with your student loan and paid out to you with your student loan. So that's one of the major things at Cambridge. I can't remember exactly what Oxford's kind of setup is. I think they have something similar, but I know the Cambridge bursary is our kind of headline one and every college will have different support for different things available as well. Like there's travel grants, for example, for if you want to travel related to study. And I've seen some very tenuous links to study as well. So a lot of people are like, here's 500 quid for a basically a holiday that you've managed to link to your degree course. Um, things like study related expenses, like if there's equipment that you need that you shouldn't reasonably have to pay for, college will pay for. Um, there's things for high level sport, things like that. So there's a lot of financial help available. So, yeah. I saw a question. Yes. Do you know, have any idea what the thresholds are? You know, because here at White, there's seven thousand pounds or below mm -hmm. to be eligible for free transport, free food. Interestingly, twenty percent of people who are eligible for that don't take it up. So I probably think they probably think of it might aim too much. So for a lot of the college based support that isn't that's not based on household income that's just based on what you need so if you have had to buy something that costs you a lot of money then the college will pay for it um, so a lot of those don't aren't reliant on your household income the only one that is is the Cambridge bursary and that I can't remember off the top of my head but that's published on the website um, but the key thing with that is you don't have to apply for it it's automatically paid out to you because it's assessed the same way as your student loans are so so long as you've given evidence towards your student household income for your student loans the Cambridge bursary is automatically paid to you so you don't even have to know if you're eligible for it which is pretty handy um, but yeah have a look if you google the Cambridge bursary it will tell you exactly how much you can get um, based on your household income I would definitely have a look at that but most other college-based support isn't necessarily means tested um, there is every college will have a hardship fund if you find yourself in unexpected financial hardship to help you out. But for most things, things like travel grants, there isn't. It's not about your household income. It's just so everybody can experience have the same university experience. Essentially, you're not limited by what resources you may or may not have, which is really good. Um, but a lot of the Cambridge colleges have a lot of money and they're not shy about spending it on their students. So make the most of this. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the main things. Again, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. This is kind of the same thing. But as I said, one of the main things about Cambridge that makes it different are kind of 
the small group teaching supervisions the other thing is that especially at Cambridge our courses start out pretty broad um, and then they kind of specialize so for example, our sciences course. I imagine there's a few people, a few people here interested in sciences. Um, we don't have separate chemistry, physics, biology degrees. Um, they're set all together in what's called natural sciences, and it's sort of our own, like a build your own science course. Um, so it's really flexible, and you can kind of choose which papers you want to study and you can specialize when whatever area you want to but you can also keep it broad so that's what a lot of our courses do they start out quite broad and then they will specialize into the particular area you want to go to so that's again a little bit different um, and of course obviously a lot of the people teaching our subjects the academics at Cambridge are world leaders in their subject so there's a lot of um, amazing experts you can work with um, so as I said I've already kind of talked about the main areas of support the other things that I haven't mentioned, um, the university has a counselling service as well, as well as in college support. Um, and the other one I want to flag is the Disability Resource Centre um, because you can contact them for advice even before you apply to Cambridge. Um, so if there's anything you might need support with, and that can be like a physical disability, but it could also be a learning difficulty, something like dyslexia, ADHD, something like that, contact them um, and they can they can support you or let you know what they can do to support but yeah you don't have to be a Cambridge student to contact them and if then you get an offer you can contact them and get support in place before you even get to Cambridge so keep an eye out for them they are great um, and then the other thing is that while you're at Cambridge while you're at Oxford you don't have to spend all your time working you have time to do fun things I promise um, and it's a bit of a learning curve learning to balance your own time but you can get up to all sorts of things. Um, in terms of what Cambridge is like as a kind of, as a city for students in their free time, there's loads and loads of university clubs and societies. So you have them at university level, but also at college level. So depending on how kind of casual you want to be. So for example, every college has a football team and they play against other colleges at the weekend. And that's like a really nice casual fun thing to do. But then there's also university level football teams that play against other universities. Um, often against Oxford very competitively. Um, and then, so it, depending on what level you're at, and that's the same with music, with drama, with all sorts of things, there's different levels you can get involved in. And a lot of them you can get involved in for free or really cheap and they're very casual. Um, and some of them are higher level if you're kind of higher level at something and you wanna get involved in it. In the city, there are loads of pubs, there's clubs, there's bars. Um, there's theatres, lots of different things. Um, as I said, Cambridge isn't a huge city, but there's a lot going on. Um, and we're like 50 minutes on the train from London if you want to go to a bigger city. So it's a really nice city. Um, it is very a, a quite rural in the sense it's a bit like the countryside is a city. Like you will find parks that have cows in them. And that's a normal thing in Cambridge, which is ridiculous. Um, at King's College in, uh, in the summer, spring through autumn, we have cows that live in King's College as well. Again, that's just a normal Cambridge thing and makes no sense anywhere else other than Cambridge. But yeah, so um, it's a bit odd. Um, we don't have any kind of big tall skyscrapers type of things. But as I said, we're quite, we're quite near London as well. And as I said, Oxford feels quite similar as well. They're quite similar in terms of how the cities feel. Um, so that is kind of a very quick intro to Cambridge itself. Um, I figured I'd go over what I mean by colleges. Um, as a quick show of hands, are any of you guys kind of familiar with the collegiate system? Do you know what I'm on about when I say colleges? Yeah, I see also a lot of shaking heads and confused faces. Cool, so I will explain what a college is. Um, so that's what I thought. At this point, you probably don't know much, too much about it. But the key thing is Oxford and Cambridge are split up into colleges. So on that map, kind of I showed you before, uh, most of those orange buildings I was talking about, you can't see it here, it's a bit small, but they are all colleges. Um, Cambridge has, I think, 29 undergraduate colleges something like that. We've got quite a lot and Oxford is about the same, about 30 colleges. There's also a couple of graduate colleges too. Um, in terms of how a college works, to use a bad analogy, your college is like your Hogwarts house. Everyone knows what I mean when I say this, uh, but basically they're like a mini campus. So they're where you live. Um, it's where your accommodation is. It's where you spend your time. Um, but your teaching is the same no matter what college you're at. So you have your teaching in the faculty with students from across um, the whole university studying your course. But your college is where you live and where you spend your time, if that makes sense. So in terms of how the responsibilities break down, so 
In your faculty, they determine your course content. You'll learn the same thing no matter what college you're at. So one of the things I get asked a lot is, what is the best, sub the, the best college for this subject? And the answer is none of them. They're all exactly the same. So your college choice should have nothing to do with the subject you want to study. So your college, um, your faculty determines your course content. They organise the majority of your teaching. So lectures, practicals, seminars, all of that happens in the faculty with people from across the whole university. Um, they also, they set all your exams, they mark all your exams. And at the end, your degree will be from the University of Cambridge or the University of Oxford. They won't say a college on there. So colleges, on the other hand, if you apply to Cambridge or Oxford, you will apply directly to a college. So you have to choose a college. You can also submit an open application if you don't mind, but that means we assign you to a college. So it means you will have a college that you apply to, and that means it's just easier for us to deal with, and it means we can organise things like interviews because we ha don't have a university's worth of students. We've divided that into 30, and we have a manageable amount of applicants. So we can get to know you as an individual rather than one of many thousands of students who have applied. So the only teaching that happens in college are supervision, so the small group teaching I was talking about. Although when you're further along in your degree, and especially if you get more specialised, if the expert you need isn't at your college, then you'll just go to the other college where they are. So you're not limited by who's at your college, but you probably will get to know the academics in your college, in your subject quite well. Um, and then the main thing about colleges is that they provide your accommodation, they provide your recreational facilities, they're where you eat, um, they're where you live, where you spend your time. So in terms of like kind of in more detail, I mean, I don't know how well you can see these, but um, these are just some pictures of the different colleges. But in terms of how this kind of breaks down, so the main thing I guess most people think about a college for is it's where they live, it's their accommodation. So every college will have a mix. Um, these are both examples at King's. Um, the one on the left, um, that's Bodley's, um, and that is on the River Cam. It's that kind of very typical, like old school Cambridge accommodation, what you'd kind of expect from Cambridge. Um, it was built in the 1800s sometime. It's actually the building that Alan Turing stayed in while he studied at King's, which is very cool. Um, so his bedroom, I don't know if you can see it here, but it's on the right hand side, kind of up at the top. That's where Alan Turing's from, which is very cool. Um, and these buildings are kind of what you'd expect from Cambridge accommodation. So some of these rooms have fireplaces in and they've got really beautiful windows. They've got some of them are what's called sets. So they have a bedroom and then a separate living room study area. So you get two rooms in your student accommodation. But because these are old buildings, they're shared bathrooms. The kitchens are normally not the most well equipped. So some of these have what are called jip rooms, again, Cambridge slangs, but it's basically not a full kitchen. So it's like a kettle, toaster, microwave, like maybe a hob. It's not a kitchen for you to cook in. Um, some are, so they're slowly being upgraded, but yes, yeah, some of the old ones, they kind of design in that way. Whereas some of the newer accommodations, so the one on the right, that's Garden Hostel, that looks over our fellow's garden just out the back of King's, um, and that is way more modern, um, which means it has nice new buildings, nice ensuite bathrooms, big fancy kitchens with lots of social space. So there's a difference, and every college will have a mix of the different types of accommodation. Obviously, if you pick a newer college, then they will only have new accommodation, but they all have a bit of a mix. So that's the kind of thing to think about. Like, do you want the really cool, pretty room that might ha have terrible Wi-Fi, or do you want the nice, fancy new building? So th there's a mix. Um, so that's something to think about. And if you go visit, if you go to the open days, you can see the types of accommodation that different colleges have. And there's always an absolute mix. Um, and then the other thing about your college is it's your social community. So you eat in your college. Um, one of the other kind of big differences between Oxford and Cambridge and other universities is normally, I don't know if you guys have started to look at types of uni accommodation, but at most halls of residence, you normally have to choose between catered and self-catered. And those are your options and that's it. Um, at colleges, they, every one of them has a canteen. They have a servery where you can go and get your food from, but it's basically up to you when you eat there. Um, you just go and you, not at, so at King's, um, you just scan your university card and at the till and it just gets added onto your college bill at the end of term, whatever you get. Um, and it's subsidised as well. Um, so, so it's really cheap. You can, get a, you can get a meal and a dessert for like a fiver, like it's not expensive. Um, 
And then there's also like a coffee shop at King's. Pretty much every college will have their own bar um, and then different kitchens and stuff that you can use as well. Um, don't know how you can see the picture. The hall at King's is awesome. It looks like Hogwarts Hall. It's very cool. Um, they all vary, but every college will have a hall. Some of them do look like Hogwarts. Some colleges, so like at King's, everyone eats in the same hall. So all the students, the staff, the academics, which I think is really cool, um, everyone in the same place. Um, some colleges will have one canteen for students and one for staff, or they might have one that's just like in every day and one for when they have the fancy formal dinners. So they might change it up. I know Christ's College do that, um, but th there's a mix. Again, maybe something to think about. And then the other kind of facilities in your college. So things like gyms, Most a lot of colleges have a gym. At Kings, we've got two, they're both really little, but one's in an old bank vault, which is kind of cool, which is like a weights gym and one's a little cardio gym. Um, they'll have a mix, different colleges have different facilities on that front. Um, I think three colleges have their own swimming pools, which is cool. Only one of these is an indoor swimming pool, and that is an important distinction. Um, so Girton College has an indoor swimming pool, which is very cool. Um, a couple of the others, like Christ, have outdoor swimming pools. And in the summer, that is great. At this time of year, not the best. So yeah, again, something to think about. Um, and then other things, like so a couple of the things we have at King's uh, are a bit different. We have allotments in our fellow's garden, which is kind of cool if you're a gardener. Um, and if you're away for like over vacation, the gardeners look after it for you, which is super handy. I wish a gardener looked after my garden while I was away. I'm expecting crispy plants when I get home. Um, and then we have like art rooms that students can use. You don't have to be studying an art degree. Anyone can use the art rooms. Um, and they're just for students, you just kind of, you can go in at any time, there's loads of equipment you can use. Um, they do regular competitions in there as well, so I think with, it's just finished and you can get like a £500 in prize money. One of the, the students who won it got £500 and it was judged by one of our art historians at college, like a professional art historian, which was super cool. Um, and like music practice rooms, things like that. And every college has a mix of different things. So Churchill College has a massive rugby pitch out the front. It is huge, they've got so much space, so again, Think about the kind of things that are important to you. That's the kind of thing to think about with colleges. Um, and then your college is like an intellectual community as well. So they have a library, every college has a library, they have a study space, but also it's a place where you'll end up mixing with loads of people from loads of different backgrounds and people studying all sorts of different courses. So you're not just mixing with the people on your course, but people from all over the place. Yeah. Depends how strict the college is. If you make a friend at that college, then absolutely, they, will, they can take you kind of wherever. Um, some colleges are pretty chill about who they let in. Some colleges are a bit more strict, so it will depend. Um, but your best bet is making friends at other colleges and they will happily let you in. I know plenty of people who make it a goal during revision to go and study in all the different faculty and college libraries and just keep switching it up um, and going to other colleges bars and trying them out in the evenings and things like that. So you can definitely go to other colleges and kind of have, a, have an explore of them. But yeah, your best bet is making friends at different colleges and they can show you around. Um, but some college you just let, will just let university members in to have a look. Um, it depends what their rules are. Usually if they're open during the day, like to, because a lot of them have tourists come and visit and stuff as well, they'll let you have a look around, but they might be a bit more strict at night because obviously students live there as well. So it kind of depends, but usually you can get your way in. Kind of depends. Um, yeah, and then the other thing that happens in college, as I said, is the supervision system. So that's the only teaching that will happen in your college. So with that in mind, the other question that I get asked all the time is, well, how do I pick a college? You've just told me there are 30 of them and my teaching doesn't make any difference. So how do I decide? Um, and basically, buy what you like best. Um, to give a bit of context to some of the colleges, so the oldest college in Cambridge is Peterhouse. Um, they were founded in 1281, I think. Um, so a long old time ago, there are Oxford colleges that are even older than that. So Oxford was the first university in the UK. Cambridge was the second, which was founded, if I am right in my history, basically the Oxford scholars got in a lot of trouble in Oxford because they were too rowdy and I believe someone was murdered and they all got kicked out of Oxford and then a lot of them settled in Cambridge and started Cambridge University. And then they were let back into Oxford and that's why there's two universities. Um, and then there were no more universities in the UK until Durham was founded in the 1830s. So there were literally no universities between Cambridge being founded in the 1200s and Durham in the 1830s. So that's why Durham is very like Oxford and Cambridge, because at that time that was just how universities were. Um, and then we got 
other universities. So yeah, in case you're wondering why Oxford and Cambridge are weird and have very old traditions, it's because they're like a thousand years old, <laughs> um, copied each other essentially. Um, but Peter House is the oldest. They're also the smallest college um, in terms of student numbers, so they have they're the, the least amount of undergraduate students. Um, they are also physically kind of tiny and doesn't bother me because I am five foot two, but they have some very, very low doors. So if you are a tall person, that is genuinely something to consider. And it sounds stupid, but that is honestly something to consider when making college choices. Do you have to duck through the door? Um, the biggest college is Trinity. They've got the most students. They're also incredibly rich, Trinity College. Um, I think it's still the case, but you used to be able to, and I'm sure this is still the case, walk from Cambridge to London on land owned by Trinity College Cambridge because they had a lot of old rich people who were there and bequeathed them a lot of land and this is now how they have a lot of money. Um, they own so much of Cambridge, it is mad. Um, but they're also the biggest in terms of students, so they have a lot of undergraduate students. Kings, where I'm from, we're kind of in the middle. So we have about 135, 140 undergraduate students a year, about 500 undergrads in total, and we've got quite a lot of postgrads as well. Um, but it kind of, it, it varies across the colleges. Um, there's also some a lot, colleges that are a lot newer. So I mentioned Churchill before as having a massive rugby pitch and loads of space. They are over by the science site. So they're a lot closer to the science site, but they're outside of the center of the city. They've got loads of space and they're really new. They are, were founded in the 1950s, as you can probably tell by the architecture. Um, but they were founded in the 1950s, so they're a lot newer, um, which means all of their rooms have good Wi-Fi, um, unlike some of the King's rooms, which are notoriously terrible. Um, and then the newest college, at least the newest undergraduate college, is Robinson. And they were founded, I can't remember, about 20 years ago, something like that. So they're the newest one. So you've got a mix between about 800 years between colleges, basically. So there's a difference there's a, there's a variety so that's something to think about um, there's also a few colleges um, that uh, so there's three mature colleges that you can only apply to if you're 21 and over the fact that that is the category for mature is a little bit terrifying but there we are um, but basically students who haven't gone straight from university um, uh, straight from college um, and then there are two women only colleges so that's Newnham and Murray Edwards as well so that's something to consider. And also not every college does every subject as well. So pick your subject first. So at King's, we don't do veterinary medicine, land economy or education, but we do every other subject. Um, and some of the other smaller subjects, they're not at every college. And that's just because 30 colleges, if there's only a small number of students, if you divide them between all the colleges, it makes more sense to have a few more at some of the other colleges, basically. Um, so in terms of whether it's for you, the first thing to think about is do we have a course you actually want to study? Always pick the course before you pick the university because even if a course has the exact same name at different universities, it can be completely different. So look at the course first. Do we have a course you actually want to study? And will you actually enjoy the teaching environment? Like when I was talking about supervisions, does that sound great or does that sound like absolute hell on earth? So think about how you want to learn and that's how you kind of pick a uni first. Um, and also look at how things, things are assessed, that kind of thing, like that's, think about how you learn. Um, and then are you on track to receive the, achieve the entry requirements? So for Cambridge, um, for sciences courses and for economics, um, the entrance requirements are A star, A star, A. Um, and for, uh, for arts and humanities um, and for veterinary medicine, it's A star, A, A, at A level. Notice I'm only saying three A levels at most. Uh, I've never seen an offer for more than three A levels, if that's a relief to anybody here. Every, a, a lot of people seem to think to go to Cambridge, you need like, to come at us with like five A stars. And we do have people who come at us with that, and I don't know how they do that. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get an offer over somebody who's doing three A levels and on track to meet our entrance requirements. Because it's also about how well you're going to do at Cambridge and whether you're interested in your subject. And there's a lot of factors we consider other than just grades. Um, and I'll talk about some of those in a bit. Um, so yeah, in terms of the actual steps of making an application, um, first thing to think about is do your research. So research your courses, research your colleges. That's something you can start thinking about now. Um, I know some of you are already pretty decided what you want to study. Some of you probably still trying to work it out. If you can visit, then do, but there's loads of info on the websites, things like that. Um, if you come down at an open day, all the colleges are open. You can have a nosy around all of them and all the faculties will be open. If you 
find yourself in Cambridge on another day, just drop the college you want to visit an email and they'll almost certainly let you in and have a look around. Like if you're ever at King's, just email me and I'll make sure I'll give you a visit to Bath. So long as college is open, you can come and have a nosy around. So always contact the colleges if you're in um, Cambridge, same at Oxford, just ask the colleges. They're normally very happy to let you in. If you're a, just say, I'd quite like to study here, can I have a look around? And they'll say yes. Um, so choose your course, you need to develop an interest in your course and I'm sure you'll have loads of stuff coming up about supercurriculars and all of that, all of that jazz, so I won't go up into too much detail but you need to develop an interest in your course, show that you're interested in your course um, and then make an application. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about next basically, how to cover application, what the application process is. Um, for those of you who haven't decided on a course yet, that's completely fine if you haven't. Um, the key things to think about, what do you actually enjoy? You have to enjoy your subject. What are you good at? What kind of areas are you excelling in? What are your skills? Are you taking the necessary A-level subjects? If anyone has any questions about um, subject requirements for different Cambridge subjects, just ask. Um, I'll let you know what you need. Um, some have required A-levels. Um, and how is it structured? How is it taught? And does that appeal to the way you learn? Because that's super important as well. Um, these are all the courses that we have at Cambridge. Um, the key ones that are a bit different, as I mentioned before, natural sciences is our kind of covers most of the sciences. Um, anyone interested in languages, we've got two languages courses. So there is modern and medieval languages and that's European languages. So French, Spanish, Italian, etc. Um, and Asian and Middle Eastern studies, which is Arabic, Hebrew, Chinese, Japanese. Um, and you can combine the two of those as well if you want to combine them. Um, the other kind of Cambridge exclusive one that is quite popular is hum uh, Human Social and Political Sciences, HSPS. Um, that's a mix of sociology, politics um, and anthropology. So that's a mix of different subjects too. You tend to start out broad and then pick one of the streams to then focus on in your second year and then specialise. But it's kind of up to you where you want to go. Um, so they're the main ones. Um, if anyone's got any subject specific questions, please just ask me and I can run you through the courses and any particular requirements. I'm pretty much course 101 at this point. So if I don't know the answer, I can certainly find it for you. Um, so what are we actually looking for? This is true for Oxford. This is true for all of the unis that you guys are looking at, all the top universities. They want to see independent thinking and critical thinking. Can you think for yourself? Um, intellectual flexibility. So can you think around a problem? Can you adapt the knowledge you've already got in new situations? Communication skills. So can you get academic ideas across? Not can you speak ama amazingly to a room full of people? You don't need to be an amazing orator. That's absolutely fine. Um, you do, we don't need a smooth performance. We don't need a great public speaker. A lot of our academics are not great public speakers especially the computer scientists, um, but they can get their academic ideas across and that's the point. So whether it's through um, an interview, like in person, whether it's through writing, however it is, can you communicate academically? Can we actually teach you? Well, are you will you do well at Cambridge? Are you suitable for our course? Um, your academic ability, so what grades are you getting and your potential, will you do well at Cambridge? A solid school record, so we want to see that you've done well in school previously um, and that you meet any subject specific selection criteria, so are you taking the right subjects? Notice this says you don't need a perfect school record, you don't need perfect GCSEs to apply to Cambridge. I never tell you attends this, but Cambridge doesn't have any GCSE requirements. Um, so if you've got any just slightly dodgy GCSEs, don't panic about it and don't let that put you off. Some universities do have GCSE requirements, but Cambridge doesn't. Um, that's just because we know there's a lot more context involved and, than GCSE grades will give us. Um, you have to do GCSEs and subjects you're not interested in. So if you got a D in English at GCSE or like if you didn't do well in English and you're applying to computer science, like we don't care, that's not relevant. And Obviously, a lot of you, well, obviously, you do GCSEs in different schools, um, you learn differently. There are so many reasons why you might not have got on with your GCSEs and might not have done well. The only time that they're kind of relevant um, and that we might be a bit worried about your GCSEs is if, for example, you're predicted an A star in your English A level and you didn't do that well in your English GCSE, we might be a bit like, hmm, how are you sure you're going to get this grade? Um, but if your teacher says in your reference that actually they're perfectly capable of getting this grade for these reasons, then we're like, cool, okay, that's fine. 
So if there's anything about your GCSEs that you think might be a bit of a warning sign, just make sure your teacher mentions it in the reference, but otherwise don't panic about them. Um, and then the most important thing is passion for your subject. We want to see that you are interested. I'll tell you a secret about Cambridge. Our academics are all giant nerds and just want to teach other people who are as nerdy about their subjects as they are. Um, and it's kind of that simple. So basically, we just really want to see your interest. Um, and that's where kind of your super curriculars will come in further down the line. But honestly, and that's what we look for at interview. Are you interested? Can you think like a Cambridge student? And are you just really interested in your subject? Like that's so important. Um, I won't go into this in too much, but in terms of where you can research courses, there's loads of stuff on the website. Um, and I know you're gonna get so much info about super curricula, so I'm not gonna talk about this now, but if you want any help finding resources, just drop me an email and I can always help out. Um, but there's a lot of stuff on the websites as well. Um, and make sure you are prioritizing your A-levels and not spending all your time doing extracurricular research because you still need to get your grades. And don't panic too much, kind of make sure you're staying healthy and staying sane as well. So the application process, in terms of what we actually look at, there's a bunch of information that we get that we consider. So firstly, your grades, A-levels, GCSEs, all the grades we've got. We look at your personal statement, which is part of your UCAS form. We look at your teacher's reference. We look at any work you've submitted, um, any admissions assessments, if they're relevant, and your interview. And all of that is looked at all together and in context, and nothing is more important than anything else. So basically what I'm saying is don't panic if you have an admissions assessment and it terrifies you. Um, it's not the only thing we're looking at. I'll let you know the subjects that's relevant for, but in terms of the timeline, the kind of things to think about now, choose your course, think about colleges, develop an interest in your course and check any relevant deadlines. Um, your UCAS application deadline, if you apply to Oxford or Cambridge or medicine, dentistry or veterinary medicine is earlier. It is the 15th of October. There will almost certainly be an, uh, be an earlier internal deadline. Someone ever miss tells you that your deadline is, is what your deadline is. It's probably the end of September, I'd imagine, um, that you need to get your application done by so they can add in the reference and all the relevant info. Um, at Cambridge, we have an additional application form, which I'll run you through. It's really straightforward and it's done online. Um, you submit any written work if that's relevant, you do your admissions test, interviews are in December and decisions go out in January. So the decisions for this year's applicants went out a couple of weeks ago, uh, 23rd of January, I want to say. Um, so they've all gone out. Um, so that's kind of what we the process we're looking at. I won't talk about the UCAS form too much because again, I think if you're not already, you will become intimately familiar with UCAS and will even hate the word UCAS. Um, but basically this is the form where you put on your grades, your personal statement and your teacher will add a reference. Again, I think you're gonna have an awful lot of coaching and personal statements going forwards. Um, and I run a whole bunch of personal statement webinars online as well. Um, but if you need any help with personal statements, I can definitely come back and chat to you guys or you can hop on one of my online sessions and I'll go through that. But I won't go through that too much in detail because I know you get so much info about that. Um, assessments, okay, so the assessments at Cambridge have changed for um, your applications basically for applications starting next year. This is because the um, assessment company called Cambridge Assessments who used to run them for us um, have stopped running them so a new provider is taking on the assessments. So there's a bit of a change. So basically if you want to study for uh, apply to any of these subjects so computer science, economics, engineering, law, medicine, natural sciences, veterinary medicine or chemical engineering, and I think that's a few of you in this room, you will need to make sure you're registered for an admissions assessment. A key difference with these is that they are now self-registered. Your school can't register for you, you have to register yourself. Um, and you sit them at any Pearson test centre. So anywhere you can do a driving theory test, you can do these tests basically. Um, so there will be at least one centre in Hull. I think there's a couple, I think there's quite a few. So you can pick somewhere nearby. You need to make sure you're registered on time. So the deadlines for um, registration will be a few weeks before the assessment date. Um, the assessment dates are in October. You need to make sure you're registered by September, but the applications, the registrations will open in August. They'll open in the summer. Register as early as possible so you get the location you want. Um, make sure you're registered on time is basically the headline for this. In terms of the tests, um, so 
For those of you um, interested in engineering, natural sciences, chemical engineering and veterinary medicine, it's a new test. It's the engineering and science admissions test. Um, so that's new for this year. It's taken over from a couple of the two separate tests we used to have for those. Um, for these, um, for most of these tests, there's multiple sittings of them because they're used by other universities like Imperial College London use them. But for Oxbridge, you have to apply for the October sitting. So that's important as well. Um, so for computer science and economics, it's the TMUA, um, which has run in previous years, but it's switched by who's running it. Um, and for both of these two, there will be sample papers, um, like example papers, online um, by the spring um, for the new versions of it so you can have a look through them for um, yeah just to add to that while you're here um, the pre-stem program at college covers those tests and, and ah yes so if any of you are interested mm -hmm. in those subjects and you're not on the pre-stem program yes i was to say if there's support relevant. definitely yeah so if you're relevant for one of those subjects make sure you just uh, make sure everybody knows and you get the support you need for those um, for medicine, it will, but they've stopped the BMAT, so we'll be using the UCAT. If anyone is uh, a medic, you'll probably have need that for most of your universities anyway, so you're probably already aware of that. And um, for law, you need to register for the LNAT. That's been running for the past few years, so there's loads of information out there already. And again, I'm sure you guys have loads of resources for, for these anyway. In terms of, um, so, as I said, Cambridge has an additional questionnaire as well. So it's called My Cambridge Application. It's online and you can do it in as many sittings as you want. Basically, when we get your UCAS application through, um, we send you the link to this immediately. The deadline for this is a week after, so the 22nd of October, and it's not a valid Cambridge application if you haven't completed this, so complete the form. They say it takes an hour, it takes way less than that. Basically, they just ask for things like your class sizes, what actual topics you're studying at A-level, that sort of thing. Um, there's also a space for an optional Cambridge-specific personal statement in here. It's a lot smaller, um, but it's basically because we know that your personal statement goes to all your universities and sometimes you're applying to a course at Cambridge and a different course everywhere else. So maybe physics everywhere else and natural sciences at Cambridge or sociology everywhere else and HSPS at Cambridge. So if you want to say anything about the Cambridge course, you can do. It's optional, no advantage or disadvantage to doing it, but the space is there if you need it. And again, there is loads of resources about this. There's a whole guide about this on the university website, but it's really straightforward. The key thing is don't leave it till the last minute to submit because that is inevitably when your Wi-Fi goes down and everyone panics. So uh, yeah, make sure you submit it on time. The deadline is strict. So in terms of what to expect from the admissions assessments, the key thing is just make sure you're registered and make sure any adjustments you normally have, like extra time, you get in place for these as well. Um, test papers, example papers will be online. Um, for the new ones, they'll be online in the next couple of months at the latest. Just double check if there's anything you're not familiar with um, and just, yeah, go over the details. The key thing for these, though, is that there's no pass or fail mark. You don't have to hit a certain score to get an interview. There's no pass or fail mark because we know that a lot of people get a lot more support than others. Like people at private school will get loads and loads of coaching on these and you guys might not like and that's fine. And they don't expect any knowledge beyond what you'd or ordinarily have at this stage at A level. So. Keep focusing on your A-levels. The thing that throws people most is more just the questions are set out in a way that you're not as familiar with, but the content's the same. So just be aware of them, keep an eye on them and make sure you're registered, but don't panic too much about what score you get. Um, written work, so for those of you who are thinking of applying to arts and humanities courses, it varies by college, but for most of these, you need to submit some written work. Um, this can be any kind of essays you've written in college, anything marked by a teacher. You don't need to write anything special. I have a little cover sheet which explains kind of how it was written. So was it an exam piece? Was it homework? That sort of thing. And that gets submitted. There's a, your college will let you know how to submit it, but normally it's just via an online form. Really straightforward. But for some subjects, these are the subjects it's relevant for at King's, but it varies a bit by college. Um, the key thing is that, yeah, just submit it, anything you've done at school. Um, and if you need more info about those, just ask, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then, so we look at all of that and then we decide who we would like to interview. So in terms of why we interview, basically it's because we um, look at applications as colleges rather than a whole university, 
we get a chance to look at you better as whole people and we are really privileged that we get to interview you. Um, unless you're into you're kind of applying to medicine, we will probably be the only university you interview at. Medics, you will get armfuls of interviews, sorry about that. Um, but for everybody else, um, pretty much it's just Oxford and Cambridge that interview. Um, but we interview for a few reasons. Um, it's so we can get to know you better. Like we get a lot of applicants who look really good on paper and it's not until we talk to you um, and actually get a, we get a better sense of who you are and whether you do well at Cambridge. So it helps us assess your potential, distinguish between lots of people who look quite similar on paper. It means we can assess you fairly, um, but they're also interviews are designed to be like the, su the supervision system, like a tutorial. It's a bit artificial because it's an interview, um, but the point is we want to see how well you'll do in the Cambridge environment, basically. Would you suit our teaching style? Um, there'll be loads of advice about interviews kind of closer to the time, so don't worry too much now. But to kind of go through what to expect from an interview, Cambridge and Oxford are slightly different in the sense that Cambridge interviews are generally just on one day. Oxford interviews tend to cross over a couple of days. Um, I'll explain why in a minute, but you will know your interview times in advance. We will let you know on your invitation to interview when your interview is, who it is with, what to expect. At Cambridge, you can be invited back in January, um, but not at Oxford. Um, this is basically because we both have a system of making sure it's fair no matter what college you apply to. Um, but we do it in January and Oxford do it in interview week and that's why they can interview on, on different days. But basically, it's called the pool um, at Cambridge, the winter pool. And basically, if we have a bunch of really strong applicants for one subject and we think you're awesome, but we just don't have a place for you at our college, We'll put your application in the pool and that means other colleges can look at your application. The other colleges can then, um, might decide they want to give you an offer over one of their applicants. So it means it's fair no matter what college you apply to essentially. Um, and this happens all the time. There's a lot of students who get offers from colleges they didn't apply to um, and that's completely normal. Um, but this means sometimes the colleges looking at your application might decide they'd like to interview you again doesn't happen very often but sometimes it can so that's why you can get interviewed in January usually you have either one interview or two interviews it depends on the college and subject it varies a little bit um, and usually two interviewers or one interviewer and an observer um, they're about half an hour um, each interview if you've got two interviews you maybe they'll be a little bit shorter if you've got one they might be a bit longer but about half an hour Sometimes you get a text to look at in advance. If that's the case, it'll be on your interview invitation and they'll let you know. And again, if you have extra time for reading, you'll get extra time for that too. And it's just so they've got something new to talk to you about in your application, like in your interview. Um, and they are focused and they are challenging, but they are very much focused on your subject. So a lot of people, you've, I'm sure all of you have heard some of the, uh, the rumours about those impossible to answer Oxford and Cambridge interview questions that sound horrific. That is not the case. We do not do that, I promise. Um, they will be about your subject. So they're designed to be like a supervision. So they're kind of looking at, they'll, they'll, it'll be a conversation about your subject. So I'll be looking at how you deal with information. Can you apply the knowledge you've got in a new situation? Um, can you experiment with new ideas? Can you adapt your opinions? All that kind of thing. Can you follow prompts? All that sort of thing. But the key thing is that there are no trick questions. No one's trying to catch you out. It is a conversation. It is not an interrogation. They're not trying to break you or anything like that. I've heard that before. Um, and it's not the final hurdle either. It's not like it's the, the interview is the most important thing once you get there. Like we still afterwards look at every aspect of your application. Like you basically the admissions tutor and the academics um, who have interviewed you will sit down um, and have a meeting and discuss everyone's application in full again and then decide who they'd like to give an offer to. So it's certainly not the only thing. And I've certainly seen students who haven't performed as strongly at interview, but have done really well with the rest of their application. Um, and then the other way around as well. Um, it, so it varies a lot. Um, in terms of how to prepare, again, you don't really need this yet, but just refresh your memory about your course, about the things you've submitted, your written work, anything like that. And the key thing is practice thinking about academic ideas, 
thinking out loud and discussing academic ideas out loud because that feels really unnatural especially if you're a scientist you're used to just writing things down and working it out but if you can discuss academic ideas out loud you can kind of we can see we want to see how you think not how much you know so if we can see your thing hear your thinking process that's what we're looking for and then if you go wrong anywhere or you get stuck um, we can see where and we can guide you back on track like you're allowed to ask for help in an interview and if you're allowed to not know the answers but if you can think through what you do know then we have we know where to help you basically um, so that's a super quick intro to interviews and everything but as a recap we basically we look at all the aspects of your application as well like it's quite it's a holistic process and we look at you at a whole person in context as well so we look at your school record and your reference and your personal statement and any submitted work or assessments and your performance interview and all of that together cool so i have basically just thrown a huge amount of info at you um, so i realize this is probably a bit overwhelming um if anyone has any questions, please ask. Um, this is my contact details as well. You can drop me an email at any time. Either of those work. Um, the top one's more me, the bottom one's more all our admissions office, but either one will come and find us at any time. And this could be you're having a panic in September just before you submit your UCAS application and you need help. Like You can email me then too, that's fine. Okay, but thank you. You've been Thanks, brilliant. Yeah, no problem. Bye.